Eileen is going to do the presentation this morning. Uh, we're with the AP Network. We've been doing employee assistance for about 37 years, based in Taunton. Some materials over there. Eileen uh, does presentations on stress and happiness. Thanks for uh, asking us in this morning. Hi. 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 So we have that. So you know what happens is that it kind of washes it out. Do you mind? Mm -hmm. He'll pass out drinks and nobody and sleep. cigars. <laughs> This is our most requested seminar. I've, as Kate said, I do about seven seminars. He does about nine or ten. This, by far, is the most requested. Um, I'm talking about stress all the time. And just to give you an idea about stress, uh, which I know you know is a, is a big topic, um, there was a, uh, the, the biggest Google last year, you know what a Google is, you know, somebody Googles something, it was Robin Williams. Because um, it shocked a lot of people. He was such a happy man. And, had this ongoing depression issue no one knew about. But anyways, um, over time, uh, he was Googled two, 28 million times, 28.8 to be exact. But he has nothing on stress, because stress was Googled last year 522 million times. Think about that, you know, it's a big, big difference. So what I'm going to be talking about is stress management, because stress isn't something that you can just poof, it goes away. It's always in our lives, and actually stress is good. Stress is a good thing, okay? because it gets you energized, it gets you moving, gets you going, all that kind of stuff, so it's not a bad thing. And the reason why I put happiness into it is that if you uh, get a chance, you should, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with TED Talks. Have you ever seen the TED Talks presentations? They're really, really good. But there's one on stress, and I can't think of the man's name, but anyways, he's a Harvard professor. And he talks about stress. Years ago, um, these two gentlemen, professors at Harvard, realized that here are some kids mostly that come from affluent backgrounds, that are pretty supportive backgrounds. Some are there on scholarship that didn't come from affluent, but they managed to be pretty positive people and move forward. And what they realized is that a lot of these kids were so overly anxious, just like in our society, very anxious, very stressed, very troubled. And so they said, well, you know what, as psychology professors, we should be doing something different to try to help them out. So what they decided to do is they decided to introduce a, a lecture called Positive Psychology. And they introduced that several years ago. And at first there were, you know, half a dozen kids in the room. It's an elective, wasn't required. Um, and uh, by the end of the year, people were clamoring for it. Now they have this big, huge auditorium. You have to wait two years to get into the positive psychology lecture. That's how popular it is um, for people to try to figure out how to manage their anxiety and their stress. So I put happiness in there. It actually is, we don't just want to manage stress, we want to be happy. Don't we? I mean, is that what we're looking for? Is fulfillment in some way? That we feel a calmness about ourselves, that we feel assured that we're for the most part, except for mornings when you get up and it's minus five, mm -hmm. um, we're pretty happy. That's what people think a lot about when they think about happiness. In fact, I've talked to people, they say, I'm going to be happy in about 10 years when I move to Florida. Okay? And I usually kind of quizzically say, no, you're not. You're going to be the same person, you're just going to be warm. <laughs> You know, happiness is not about geography, and in fact, the happiest countries in the world are all in Scandinavian areas. Norway, Denmark, it's not warm there all the time. It's warm there part of the time, but it's more like New England than it is like Florida. So it's not a geographic thing. I think happiness sometimes is just being silly, you know. I love this that they built, this is nobody I know. Somebody thought this was me because I actually have a coat that looks like that. Um, but I think it's that's hilarious that's that they built the snowman <laughs> upside down. You know, that's thinking outside the box a bit. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said this, and he was the president, as you well know, during perhaps the most difficult time in our country's history. Uh, we had a civil war, not a foreign war. Yes, it's very stressful now with 9-11, post-9-11 and all of that. But think about them. You know, troops are marching up to the door of the White House. This is when he was president. And he says, we're about as happy as we make up our minds to be. I believe that. I believe that. 
I think that some people bring a lot of negativity. And when you start talking in negative language all the time, guess what it has an effect on you? If you're always awfulizing, oh, damn it, get to work today, man, cut me off in traffic, yada, yada, yada. You know, I talk like that, it becomes a part of your nature, part of your personality. What all this says is that, in the biggest headline, 61% of physicians' visits are stress-related. This comes from the American Medical Association on their website. And what they're saying is, is that when people come into the doctor's office, they most often say, I'm stressed. And what happens is, is that some people are looking for that medical cure to the stress. <coughs> and in our Western culture in the United States of America, we love our pills. We do. In the United States of America, we take, make, we take more pills per capita than any other country. The top ten pills that we take are stress relievers or they're related to stress in some way. Could be um, anti-anxiety medications, depression med medications, all of those kinds of things. So it's something we've got to pay attention to and, as you can well imagine, Antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications, they went up 42% after 9-11. Because that's where what you think about becomes a part of you. you know? uh, people all of a sudden realized that they weren't as safe as they thought they were once the towers went down. You know what I'm saying? We all felt that insecurity. And it still stays with us. I like this quote because it really talks about mind over matter. Okay? Our life experiences, what happens to us in life, will impact our brain, our moods, and our well-being. Our life experiences sometimes are things that which we have no control. You step out in traffic and you get hit by a car and now you're disabled. That's a life experience. A lifestyle is how you choose to deal with it. For some of us, we've got a good handle on our lifestyle, that we're making good choices. Like I'm talking to a wellness group, where your emphasis is to make good choices in your life. But sometimes in our lifestyle, we don't make such good choices. And we do things that are counterproductive to actually helping us with our stress. What makes you stressed may not make her stressed. Yes, I'm looking at you. <laughs> What makes you stressed may not make her, and what fixes yours might not even touch yours. It is an individual journey. Keep in mind that the stress reaction is the adrenaline reaction, and some of the adrenaline that we use is very positive in our lives. Adrenaline allows us to do great things. Mountain climb, right? It, it allows us to be super strong when we need to be. I mean, there are those stories, and they're absolutely true, of people that have gone beyond their limitations in a moment of stress, to rescue somebody, to lift a, a heavy item off of somebody, to do those kinds of superhuman things. That is the adrenaline reaction, and it goes back to caveman days. Caveman came out of a cave, he had a choice. The bear is chasing him, he's either going to beat him up with a club or he's going to run like hell. The problem with today's stress is that if you go to the bank and they tell you you have no more money, I mean, in your bank account, you can't beat him up. <laughs> and you can't run like hell. Well, you can't run, but you know, that's not going to change things. In some way, caveman, when he had that stress reaction, he actually helped himself. Because when you do physical things, you know, you're relieving some of that stress. What happens for a lot of us is that we have the stress, and it's all up here, and it wears on us. And if you ever had a really stressful day, maybe you're at the hospital with somebody who's very ill, you wake up the next morning and your muscles ache and you didn't do anything physical. Have you ever had that happen? That's lactic acid from all the adrenaline eating up your, your muscles. You know, it's the same reaction you have or feeling that you have when you start lifting weights and the next day you can't move or you're doing all those squats and the next day your thighs are burning. That's lactic acid that's at your core. So what you want to be thinking about is what makes you stressed in the first place? And how can you fix it? This is a stress reaction. Dr. Hans Selye, you can tell me by 1930s, he's the father of stress. He coined the word 
actually, and the whole terminologies around stress. Wrote volumes about it. Actually, what we're talking about when we're talking about stress is distress. There's two kinds of stress. Eustress is EU. That's good stress. And then there's distress. So we kind of just say stress, but we're really talking about distress most of the time. I'm distressed. Positive psychology. How do you interpret your life? If you think the government's out to get you every day, if you think your neighbors are out to get you, if you think life generally stinks and then you die, okay, you're not working in your best interest. And you want to sort of change that thinking. Because it does all start up here. It starts with mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. I tend to mind more than my husband. We've been together a long time. He's water off a duck's back. You could walk up to him and you could say to him, I don't like you very much. And he would say to you, I know you. <laughs> and then he'd say, should I care? <laughs> because he is more, you know, think mind, you know, it up, up in his brain thinking. I am hard on my sleeve. Got it from my mom. She cried reading a Hallmark card. Right? Or watching something sad into the tears and be falling. So if somebody comes up to me and says, I don't like you very much, I'm going, what? Why do they like me? So sometimes there's certain personalities that become more stressed than others, just by the nature of what they are, that those personalities are. If you're also the person that has to have your toothpaste two inches away from the glass, and it has to be positioned to the left upper part of your area, sink area, and if they start making tartar controlled crust, somebody's going to pay. Um, then you probably are more stressed because you feel like you have to control things. You ever met people that have to control most everything? And they kind of flip out when you tell them it's not your choice? That's all you have to say to them, and then they're off to the races. What do you mean it's not my choice? I can make my own choices. Don't you tell me what to do. <laughs> so if you really have a controlled nature about you, um, then you probably are more stressed than others. And you've got to learn how to maybe give it up, some of it up. You should be looking at what your past was and putting a period on it. Um, you know, when you hear people talk a lot about what I could have done, should have done, would have done, those are people that live in the past. It's over. You can learn from it what you should have done, could have done, would have done, but you can't change it. So if someone is talking about the past all the time, then they really are living in there. If people are looking at the future, instead of saying, I can't wait 10 years till I move to Florida, move now. What's holding you back? You know, you know when, I, when people tell me I can't stand living in New England, I say, move now. You know? You sentence yourself to 10 years in Massachusetts. Why do that? That's a prison, you know? You should be can, focusing, we should all be focusing on the present. The present is what you have the ability to change today. You get up in the morning and you decide how you're going to approach that day. You know, you might be having a bad day for a number of reasons. It doesn't mean every day you get up and skip and go happy. But if you get up and you're having a reasonably good day, and it's not minus 20, it's only minus 1, it's okay, you know, it's okay. You deal with it. You'll survive it. Put on your long johns. Do what you got to do. That kind of thing. So you want to be focusing on the present, mostly. In our culture, we tend to focus on the big screen TV, the car, the big house, you know, all of that. That's going to, what's going to make us happy. But it isn't what makes us happy in the end. It's actually, in all the studies that they've done about it, happiness comes from within and comes from gratitude, from doing things for other people, from feeling good about yourself from having self-confidence, having self-esteem. That's where it really comes from. Some of the happiest people in this world will tell you that they joined a charity or joined an organization because they can give something away. And they get more back than they actually give. They get gratitude back. You know, it's like, like the, uh, I know Oprah was big about talking about gratitude journals. You know, get up every morning and think about five things you're grateful for rather than five things that are really ticking you off. Because you can think about those things like that. But you have to sometimes remind yourself, you know what? I'm really grateful for my family members. Not all of them. 
Some of them make me crazy, but most of them I can tolerate. So the deeper thing is the relationships you have in life. Russian novelist Dostoevsky, I love that. Man is found of counting his troubles but not his joys. Don't you hear that more often from people? What went wrong? What's going wrong? What's troubling? And then, of course, Middle Eastern philosophy. Very simple. What makes you happy? Go fishing. Do something simple. But also, help somebody else. You get that back tenfold. Have you ever seen, read an obituary and somebody says everybody loved him? Everybody thought she was marvelous. She was so selfless. And you think to yourself, the luckiest person is anybody who's a friend of that person. You know? I mean, say, led by example. Now, these are the things that you have to have in your toolbox that we think. I've got a bunch of handouts I'm going to give you in the end that have all of this uh, stuff in it. Also a stress test. I'll tell you about that later. But, um, These are the things you have to have in your toolbox if you're going to be resilient, I think. Number one, you have to have some spirituality. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean organized religion, in my mind. What that means is bad things are going to happen to good people. They do every day. Baby stuff. What could they ever do, you know? Bad things happen to good people. What do you do when bad things happen to good people? Where do you go? You've got to have a place that you can eventually sort it out spiritually. Sometimes people, I remember when my brother, a year older than me, 10 years ago, uh, died of cancer. I did a lot of walking. It just somehow helped me out, you know, just getting out in the fresh air and walking. And I found all of a sudden I'm noticing, you know, that there are, there's beauty in life and there's nice things, there's birds, there's pretty trees, pretty bushes, there's neighbors that would say hello. It just kind of helped me at that time in my life. So that's what you do, is how you make sense of things. You can't make really sense of them, but how you put it all back together spiritually. My mother was a very um, religious person, Roman Catholic, and she was the last person on both sides of the family to die, you know, lived to 87. But what kept her going was her faith. It was just a faith that she had, and it just kept her, um, you know, staying positive, basically. What are some of the kind of the things we do when we're stressed? Eat sweets. <laughs> we eat, yeah, eat too much, eat sweets, eat a lot of carbs. Carbs are always good. You know, that kind of thing. By the way, my son is a personal trainer. So we don't get away with much of anything. So uh, we both work out with him and, and do that. But it really has made my life a big, big change biologically to eat better and to also to um, exercise. Because I wouldn't be able to do the things that I do. I'm 62 years of age, and I ski double diamonds, and I can't ski a double diamond if I'm not in shape. You know, I'm not bragging, I'm just saying I love to ski. That's my sport. You know, So in order to do it, you have to be in shape. You, skiing doesn't get you in shape. If you're not in shape, you fall down a lot. So, and the same thing with Pete. You know, so it's one of those things, biologically. Um, that's our, our favorite way to deal with stress. Eat too much, drink too much, smoke too much or smoke cigarettes, you know, or whatever we do, right? Those are the things that we do. But there are also other biological things that you can do. And the two top ones, you know what they are, eat healthy and exercise. If you're really stressed, exercise, and congratulations, that's a hard thing to do. Um, exercise, doesn't it make you feel better? How many people in this room like to exercise, enjoy it? Congratulations, I hate it. Okay. But that doesn't mean you don't do it. You know, it just means you just, I mean, I don't hate it, but I, I'm not one of those that's, I've got friends that get up and run five miles every day. No thanks, you know. Um, but I do it because I like how it makes me feel after I've stopped. Because doesn't it make you feel good when you're done and you've got sort of like more energy in your body? True. Yeah. You just feel good. You feel really much more alive than you know, if you're sitting around being a couch potato all day, you know, that kind of actually feeds into the, the distress and it feeds into depression. Well, there's lots of studies out there. You can Google them all and they all talk about the um, effect that exercise has on our well-being up here. And eating right, 
You know, you eat junk, you're gonna feel like junk. You gotta, you know, balance it out. Uh, my, my son who doesn't have like an ounce of fat on his body, um, he still eats junk. He says, has his junk day. He says, I, I have a cheat day. You gotta have one. You know, we eat that chocolate cake. Because those diets that we used to do, the grapefruit diet, I remember, remember that one? You know, eat grapefruits for 30 days? Really? You, know, you gotta have something besides grapefruit. Biologicals also hobbies, interests. They did a study about uh, in the 1950s, and mostly it was about men, because men were most often in my household. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, six kids. My father was out working. And they found that men, when they retired, they died within five years of retirement because they had put so much into their work that they didn't have any hobbies, and they didn't have any interests, so they got bored to death. <laughs> bored to death, it's true. Hobbies, interests, you know, sing in the shower when nobody's listening. Dance naked when nobody's watching. Be silly. Be stupid. You know, build a snowman upside down. And then tell your friends, let's all stand on our heads. You know? Those things are really important. Humor is huge. Humor is huge. You've got to laugh every day. You really do. You've got to exercise that laughter organ. Better uh, take care of that. So there's a million biological things that we can think of. Cognitive is what you're thinking. You are what you think. Like I said before, if you're negative, <coughs> it's not going to be helpful to you. You are what you think. So you change that tape. If you've got a tape in your head that came from your childhood that says you're no good, you're never going to be smart, you're not very attractive, you're not fun to be around, you change that tape yourself and you say they were wrong. I'm the opposite of all of those things, and I know it. And that's that's your job to do that, or to talk with somebody, a therapist. So cognitive also is how you can imagine yourself in a different place. That has an effect on your well-being. If your heart is racing, if you're anxious, you sit yourself down, you put yourself on that beach, on the top of that mountain, you breathe slowly, it changes everything, doesn't it? You have the great ability to change yourself and your and what's going on within yourself, and relationships are huge. You gotta have them. You gotta have good ones. Limit your exposure to toxic people. Toxic people in your life are the people that are always negative, that are dragging you down. Sometimes you're related to them. Sometimes they're just friends going through a tough time. You offer them help. You say this, but sometimes you just have to take a breather. You got a chicken in the oven. I gotta go and get around people that are more positive. Also, I think that you're really lucky if you have one of these people in your life. A person that you can tell your deepest, darkest secrets to. You can tell them your deepest, darkest, darkest fears. And after it's all said and done, they say, no big deal, I still care about you. I still love you. Here, give me a hug. Isn't it nice to have somebody you can be you with, you know? Just be open, <coughs> open book. So that's important, too. Relationships are huge. <clears throat> when you get all your panties in a bunch, will it matter a year from now? Most of the things that we get stressed about are small stuff. You know, the lines at the gas pump. The parking spaces that aren't, are missing from the market basket. Why? Okay? Other people in line in front of me. People cutting me off in traffic. Just ask yourself when you're getting all hot and bothered about it, will it matter a year from now? Will I remember this? No. You remember it if you ram somebody's car and you end up in district court because you're so ticked off you had to take out your road rage on somebody. But you won't remember it if it's just something that comes in a sleeve and comes and goes. Sure. So ask you, that's the test. What you will remember is if you've lost a loved one, if you have a serious illness, or a friend of yours, or a relative, or somebody you love has a serious, you won't forget that. It'll stay with you. But that's what you want to make sure that you have the reserves for, that you have the energy for, because the other stuff is, let it go, like they say. Or don't listen to that song anymore, because it'll make you crazy. <laughs> like a two grandchildren that sing it all the time. <clears throat> now the Tibetans know about happiness. They sim simplify their lives. Very, very simple people. 
So what you want to do is, these are kinds of the tips that you want to do. Take time out of your day. Make time for exercise. Make time for quiet time. Even if you have children, I say, if you've got children of a sufficient age, or you've got a friend that can watch them, okay, you fill up the tub, you put the bubbles in it, okay, you put a sign on the door, unless your pants are on fire, don't knock and don't come in. And you take your time for yourself. Yeah. And women are the worst offenders on that regard because we feel like we've got to do it all. Pick up the pieces, you know. Cleanest house I was ever in, 12 kids under the age of 18. You could eat off the floors. Each one had a job. Even the three-year-old. Pick up your toys, put them in the box. Age-appropriate chores. Parents skated. They didn't have to do much at all because the kids did it all. Fair enough, right? Makes sense? Be realistic about what you want in life. I wanted to be a basketball player. I'm five three. <laughs> Set reasonable goals and expectations. Same thing, but also expectations of others. If you're going to die, if your son or daughter isn't a lawyer, um, you know you're setting yourself up for like really a lot of heartache because maybe they don't want to be a lawyer. You know, maybe they want to be something that they want. Mm -hmm. Obviously, medication want to avoid. We, we just take way too many medications and now we've got this prescription drug problem that everybody's talking about as you've seen in the papers. Um, just, you know, sometimes you have to, you need that, but when you take it too long it becomes a habit and then it becomes a problem. Get organized. Talk to somebody. Choose to be positive. It's a choice. Every day you make a choice. What are you going to do? Move on. My family, world-class grudge holders. I don't know what Anne Harriet did in the 1960s, but man, nobody forgave her ever. <laughs> and I was thinking as I was a teenager, she's probably in Hawaii having a Mai Tai right now. She's not thinking at all about any of us. You know? In that expression about, like, you care what your neighbors think, you'd be surprised your neighbors don't even <clears> think about you because they're too busy thinking about themselves and their everyday lives and getting on with it, you know? It work. If you don't know what you're supposed to do, ask somebody. Clarify your role and responsibility. In your family, clarify your role and responsibility. Prioritize tasks. Needless conflict. Housewives of whatever. Okay? Anybody seen one of those shows? Housewives with flip tables because somebody looked at them sideways. You know? That's needless conflict. It's all over the place. That's what makes a reality TV so popular. Be flexible to change. The world's spinning as we're standing. Things are changing every day. If you don't like change, it's tough. It's hard. You know, because you go and you're going to buy that TV, that 50-inch TV, and you know as soon as you get into the car, they're going to have a better one advertised as soon as you get home. <laughs> you're going to buy this smartphone, and then you're going to wish that you had held off for the new <laughs> Samsung 5 version instead of the 4, because now I've got the 4, and it's old. The stress of choice is a big new stress. We've got too many choices in this world. We do. I wish they had 10 kinds of tile. Because I went to pick up tile once and I realized they have 150,000 yeah. kinds of tile. So it makes it crazy. I mean, it's stupid stuff, but it makes it crazy. Communicate. Speak in verbs to people. I need you to do this. I want you to do this. Can you help me with that? Communicate to people. Don't just say, oh, I'm not happy. You can make me happy. You're going to make me happy. No. <laughs> Happiness is an inside job. Delegate, stay in the present, have a willing and cooperative spirit. You know, you read the blogs online, and they're so depressing in some cases. Some of them are very positive when people say positive things, but for the most part, there are a lot of like negative Nancys and Neds out there. You know what I mean? Just knocking everything. You know, they, they can even knock a nun's Christmas party. You know what I mean? It's just like, really? <coughs> And managers can do all of these things. Be fair and consistent with people. Catch them doing something right. Somebody wrote on, we have a blog, we come from Taunton, they wrote, Improving Taunton, they said that they stopped by, they rolled down their window when these DPW workers were filling potholes, and he rolled down his window and he said, hey guys, it's like 10 degrees, thanks for doing that. Do you think those guys ever got that from anybody in their lives? I doubt it. What does everybody complain about? The potholes. They never complain. Say, hey, chief, thanks for fixing them. You know? So, all of these.
these kinds of things. And don't label or be judgmental. If you tell somebody, hey, you're kind of stupid, aren't you? They don't want to work for you. They don't want to be around you. You keep that in mind. The pleasure from you, your life is equal to the attitude that you put into it. You know, my grandchildren are great examples in my life. Anybody else got grandchildren here? There's some palico on that. The nice thing about grandchildren, as I always tell you, is that you can take them or leave. You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, you don't have them 24-7, so you see the best in them. But when I, I often tell people my uh, granddaughter was 10 in a ski racer now with us. Um, she, when she was about three years old, I remember she's at the back door, and I said, let's go for a walk. And she goes, sure. And she's running, no shoes, no coat, no nothing. She doesn't know where we're going. She's just going for the door. So I said, wait a minute, let's get the shoes on, stuff like that. If I ask people my age, do you want to go for a walk? You know what I hear? I hear, where are we going? Who's deciding where we're going? <laughs> I don't have the right oh, coat. Yeah. I don't want to walk. Where are we, is it going to be bumpy or is it going to be easy? Is it going to be cold? You know, just do it, like Nike says. Just do it. You'd be surprised. You know, try new things. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, I have, as I say, all kinds of handouts. This is a stress test. I'm going to leave these aside. Where are they? Over there. You can pass I'm going to leave around. these oversized. Oh, okay. You can pass them around. Yeah, that'd be great. This stress Thank test, you. what this does, and you can just give me back the extras, okay. is if you answer yes to more than six of them, I'm very serious when I say this. Sometimes people give a giggle. Yes. <laughs> but if you answer yes to more than six of those questions, then you really want to think about maybe talking with somebody professionally. Because stress will take 15 years off your life. It will make you very, very unhappy and sick. So that's one of the things. And also, and then this is um, anxious times. We are living in very, very anxious times. Again, keep your head straight on that. Um, so there are materials over there. EAP Network is an independent employee assistance program. We serve about 150 organizations, including uh, High Point, um, which is how we got uh, invited here through Mary Scott. We do trainings. Um, as I did today, we do management consultations, uh, talking to you about a workplace situation to try to help make it better. Um, we do critical incident debriefings. And lastly, mostly, we pick up uh, our telephone when, you, when our clients call, get back to them, and put them together with a psychologist, with a social worker, with a financial planner, with an attorney for personal and legal situations. As I said, we've been at this about 37 years. My main office is in Taunton, very active throughout the South Coast and uh, this area. I started uh, my business uh, in Bedford on Purchase Street. And then after about eight years, I realized I live in Taunton and I could have my office in Taunton. So we know, but we're still very active. Um, if you have questions, let us know. This is, as I even said, one of our most popular training topics. We have about 35 that we do come on site, present them. Appreciate your time and attention. If you have questions, feel free to give us a call. I think this is a really great initiative that you're doing. The more you as organizations can do for your employees to motivate them to do fitness and nutrition, to try to manage and reduce their stress, it's a very, very positive thing. And during the past two years, we've done a couple of dozen on site uh, for our client organization. So we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Hope just a reminder to get going with stuff like this. And so we appreciate your uh, initiatives and the opportunity to talk to you. We're open to questions um, now or later. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.